Let's keep talking about the naming and the classifying of the monosaccharides. So we started by just saying we can classify a monosaccharide as either an aldose or a ketose, and that would depend on the location of the carbon-oxygen double bond, either on carbon number one or carbon number two. And then we talked about how we could also classify or describe them based on how many carbon atoms were in the chain, triose, tetrose, pentose, or hexose. And then the last thing we did was look at how we can combine those two different types of naming so we can combine the aldose part and the number of carbon atoms part and we get these names like aldo tetros and keto pentose but even those names are not super specific because the keto pentose for example is telling us that we have a five carbon chain and it's telling us that our carbon oxygen double bond is on carbon number two but it's not communicating anything about whether the OH groups on the other carbons, whether the OH groups are on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the carbon chain. So that's what we're going to talk about next. And um, when we're talking about this, I, we're going to start, I'm going to start with a refresher on Fisher projections because they're an ideal way for us to draw these monosaccharides. Um, I'm not going to review generically. I'm going to review uh, specific to monosaccharides. So uh, what I'm going to do is just jump straight in to a Fisher projection. And hopefully when you see it, you'll remember it. In the Fisher projection, we drew a long carbon chain that's just represented by this vertical straight line with these horizontal lines. At the time, we were talking about how these horizontal lines represent little bow ties, if that sounds familiar to you. We're talking about the directions coming out of the molecules, and we're not going to talk about bow ties anymore. Um, so you can see that our, our vertical way of drawing the monosaccharides is really conducive to switching straight into a Fisher projection. Up at the top of the Fisher projection, we're going to draw an aldose. We're going to draw the carbon-oxygen double bond, and it's pretty normal to actually write out the carbon of the carbon-oxygen double bond the way that I did, although maybe somebody will just go straight line structure like this so the carbon atom won't actually be written. So you could see it either way. I like to have the carbon there, so I'm going to put it back. Uh, and then another thing that you might see is condensed notation for that functional group up top. So instead of drawing out that bond, you might see CHO, which is our condensed way of writing out the aldehyde functional group. We'll look at that again, but for now I don't want to draw it that way. I want to show that double bond. And also remember, I've already talked to you about the double bond leaning over to the left side or the right side, doesn't matter. And so all along this carbon chain, we're gonna have OH groups either on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the carbon chain. So I'm choosing to draw OH on the right-hand side, then the left, then the right, and the right. And the other spots have hydrogen atoms. And then down at the very bottom of the chain, we have our last carbon. So that's carbon number six. And it's, uh, it's got one OH group on it as well. Let me number these carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six. Carbon number six down here is almost always written out in condensed notation the way that it's being shown here. Um, and that's just because the position of the OH group on carbon number six, left side versus right side, does not matter at all. So writing it condensed like that saves space. So for a monosaccharide, if you are ignoring the top carbon, and which is this guy right here, and ignoring the bottom carbon, which is this guy right here, focusing on instead on all the carbons in the middle. So for this one, it's two, three, four, five, carbons two, three, four, five. The position of the OH group on these carbons dictates exactly which monosaccharide 
we're talking about. Not generic classification like aldos or aldotetros or aldohexose in this case, but the exact monosaccharide. Is it glucose? Is it fructose? Is it sucrose? What is it? So if we wanted to know what this monosaccharide was, what, what it actually was, we would refer to what's called a family tree or a table of monosaccharides. And I've linked you to a figure on the internet that has a table of aldoses and another one that has a table of ketoses. And this is one of the figures that you have linked. This is a, a tree diagram or a family tree of all of the different possible aldoses. Notice that they're called D-aldoses. I'll talk about what that D means in a second. And they're all being drawn with the condensed CHO notation instead of drawing out the aldehyde group, which I already talked about. And so what you're going to do here is look for the correct number of carbon atoms, first of all, and six carbon atoms is down in the very bottom row. And then you just are going to find the structure that has the same pattern of H and OH. Our pattern of H of OHs was right, left, right, 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 left, right, right, which if you look third one over from the bottom, that is, underneath it, it says D-glucose. So D-glucose is the name of that particular molecule that we drew. This is D-glucose. Now, when you're working on some sapling problems, you're gonna you're sometimes going to see that D part left out. So maybe you maybe you were um, looking at a problem and it said, "Here's a picture of a monosaccharide. What is the monosaccharide's name?" And you were given four different choices of monosaccharides to choose from, and none of them had the D in front of it. That's okay. Um, sometimes it's left out. Also, in another one of your sapling problems, you might see other letters, Greek letters, added to the front of the name. You could see an alpha. That's an alpha. You could also see a beta. That is not applicable at all to the monosaccharides when they're being drawn in this way. So you're looking for, when you're matching names on sapling, you are looking for just a single letter, D, or no letters at all, but stay away from the Greek letters for now. So the position of the OH groups dictates the, the molecule's name. The letter D in front of the molecule is indicating specifically the position of the OH group on the very last one of these four important carbons. So the position of the OH group on not always carbon number five, but the, the second to the last carbon, second to the last carbon dictates the D or the other option is L prefix. So that carbon, in this case, carbon number five, the second to last carbon, is really important because it gets to contribute to the molecule's name two times. So in terms of D versus L, if the OH group is pointing to the left, then we call it the L molecule. And that is awesome because left starts with an L. And if the OH group is to the right, then we call it the D molecule. So this um, glucose, I'm gonna make a little kind of a side note about glucose. Glucose is the probably maybe the most important monosaccharide to humans because we consume it in our diet either directly or as part of a disaccharide and glucose is what we use for a lot of our energy it's not our only source of energy but it is a big source of energy for us if we have excess glucose um, like with a diabetic who can't metabolize glucose properly that excess glucose can get excreted in the urine 
Uh, but you know, even for anybody that could happen. If we also, if we have excess glucose, we can store excess glucose in uh, fat cells so we can convert it to that. We can tap into our fat cells and get the glucose back from the fat cells. So that's kind of a two way street. We can also store glucose inside of our body in a polysaccharide called glycogen. And we can also access the glucose out of glycogen as well. The only problem with glycogen is that we have limited glucose storage in glycogen. So we'll store a little bit of our glucose in glycogen, but then we're going to reach that limit and all the rest of the glucose that we're bringing in, all the excess glucose is going to end up getting stored as fat. So that's kind of like an interesting cool thing about glucose. So let's go practice some more on our worksheet.